Good morning, my name is Marius Unger and I am here this morning at USB to talk about the new book of Collins and Hansen with the title Great by Choice. I will explain the different practices that he unveils in this book uh, that is relevant for leaders in the 21st century. So we're here to talk about Great by Choice. Jim Collins is not an unfamiliar author to many of you. So a few start off statements from him. We cannot predict the future, but we can create it. And his main research question, the following question, why do some com companies thrive in uncertainty, even chaos, and others do not? He named these high-performing companies 10x companies because they beat the industry index by at least 10 times. Intel, Microsoft, insurance companies, Southwest Airlines, and uh, a bio company, Biomet, and here, there you see the relative performance to the markets and then the relative performance to the industry is um, very um, impressive. However, if you look at the dates, you would see that all of those dates end in 2002. So let's talk about, about four or five of uh, the myths. The one is successful leaders in turbulent world are bold, risk-seeking visionaries. In fact, they took less risk, some of these um, companies. But what did they show? More discipline, more empirical um, orientations, and then this one that might sound negative, more, even more paranoid. The second one is that, oh, innovation, they must be like top in innovation. Then thirdly, well, if this world is so tur turbulent, then of course it must be about speed. Well, he's saying fast, fast, fast is a good way to get killed. The fourth one, well, it's all about change. The radical change on the outside requires change on the inside. The successful companies change less in reaction to their changing world than the comparative cases. And then great enterprises with these success have a lot of good luck. Both of the comparative companies, those of the non-performing and the performing companies, both have lots of luck in same amounts of good and bad. The critical question is not whether you have luck, but what you do with the luck that you get. Is then also saying that they're not saying that they lack creative intensity or ambition or courage. They display all these traits, but so did the less successful companies also. So, so if it is about behavior, what's the first thing that is saying? That they embrace the paradox of control and non-control. And, and that's a big paradox. They understand that we face continuous uncertainty and that they cannot control and they cannot accurately predict significant aspects about the world around that. That's the aspect of non-control. On the other hand, they reject the idea that forces outside their control or chance or change events determines their results. They accept full responsibility for their own faith. Then, of course, it's very good in packaging these findings. So what are the, the sort of key behaviors, the key actions that these companies then embrace? And he's summarizing fantastic discipline, empirical creativity, uh, productive paranoia, and a level five um, ambition. And start with fanatic discipline. What does that uh, then means? Discipline is a consistency of action. We all know that. But the consistency of what? Look what he's putting first. The consistency of values. Long-term goals. Performance standards of methods and a consistency over time. Discipline is not the same as regimentation, measurement, 
hierarchical obedience or the adherence to bureaucratic rules. True discipline requires independence of mind to reject the pressures to conform in the ways incompatible to what? To your values, to your performance standards, and to your long-term aspirations. Most business CEOs have a lot of um, discipline, but these performing companies operate at a different level. And he's using the word, they were fanatics on discipline. With this discipline, he then says, well, what is the practices that they, that they display? And in this case, he's uh, naming it a 20-mile march. It's more than a philosophy. It has concrete, clear, intelligent, and rigorous pursuit of specific uh, performance um, aspirations. And it implies two types of self-imposed discomforts. The one is the discomfort of unwavering commitment to high performance in difficult circumstances. The discomfort of holding back in good conditions. This is then the um, example of Southwest Airlines uh, where they hit their numbers for 30 of 30 years. This is a 20 mile reach. If we think about 20 mile reaches, it's not only about a financial target. It can be a creative march, a learning march, a service improvement march, or any other type of march as long as it has the primary characteristics of a good 20 mile um, march. Empirical creativity as the second um, uh, practice. Social psychology research is indicating that at times of uncertainty, most people look to other people, to authority figures, to peers, to group norms for their primary cues about how to proceed. These companies, in contrast, do not look to conventional wisdom to set their course during times of uncertainty, nor do they primarily look to what other people do or to what the experts say they should do. They primarily look at empirical evidence. It means relying upon direct observations, conducting practical experiments, and engaging directly with the evidence rather than relying on opinion, conventional wisdom, authority, or untested ideas. So they create their own database. Having an empirical foundation enables these companies to make bold, creative moves and bound their risk. And again, that's a paradox. They are saying that each environment, each industry has a level of threshold innovation that you need to meet to be a contender in the game. Some in industries such as airlines have a low threshold, whereas other industries such as biotechnology command a higher threshold. Companies that fail even to meet the innovation threshold, of course, cannot win. And then the practice for this uh, innovation uh, and for empirical um, creativity is calling bullets, then cannonballs. Um, first, you fire bullets to figure out what will work. Then once you have empirical confidence based on the bullets, you concentrate your resources and you fire a cannonball. After the cannonball hits, you keep a 20 mile march to make the most of your big success. So what makes up a bullet? The first one is the bullet needs to be low cost. You cannot, with this experiment, bet the jewels of the total company. The second one is the bullet needs to be low risk. And of course, the bullet needs to be of low distraction. OK, the third practice that he is then highlighting is this uh, rather difficult term, productive paranoia. But listen how he's sort of explaining that. Fear should guide you, but it should be latent. Bill Gates 
worried consistently about how might the next Bill Gates, some freaky high school kid toiling away 22 hours a day in some dingy little office coming up with a lethal torpedo to firing at Microsoft. The productive paranoia, they differ from the less successful companies in how they maintain hypervigilance and that's how it plays out. They are just m aware of what's happening. They believe that conditions will turn against them without warning at some unpredictable point in time, at some highly inconvenient moment, and that they better be pre prepared for that moment. There's then um, three practices associated with productive paranoia. The one is to have oxygen canisters available. The second one is that, of course, you're managing risk. And then the third practice associated with productive paranoia is the practice of zoom in and zoom out to then enable this vigilance. The second practice associated with productive paranoia is this uh, managing the risk. This could kill you or it could severely damage your um, enterprise. Asymmetric uh, risk where the potential downside is much bigger than the upside and then uncontrollable risk uh, where you expose the enterprise to forces uh, that you cannot um, control. The third practice of zoom in, zoom out is exactly what that is. So the zoom out sends the change in conditions and then zoom in, focus on execution of the plans and the objectives. The fourth one is this level five ambition and he's first talking about the leader. Why did people follow the leaders of these companies? These companies, these people channel their ego and intensity into something larger and more enduring than themselves. They're ambitious, absolutely, for a purpose beyond themselves. To do what? Build a great company, change the world, achieving some great objectives that's ultimately not about themselves. He calls this the smack recipe. It's a set of durable operating practices that creates a replicable and consistent success formula. What these leaders know in these companies, they know what works. And he's then just using this acronym SMAC, which stands for specific, methodical and consistent. And it is a way of describing the success formula of the firm. He's saying conventional wisdom says that change is hard. But if change is so difficult, why do we see more evidence of radical change in the less successful cases? Because change is not the most difficult part. Far more difficult than implementing change is figuring out what works, understanding why it works, grasping when to change, and understanding when not to change. So in summary, I think it's a, it's a very useful book with new practices, new ideas. There's many practical things that one can consider to make part of your own um, uh, repertoire. And uh, yes, it should be open on your desk to understand how do you become great by the choices that you make. Thank you.